Hello everyone. On behalf of Observer Research Foundation, I welcome you all to this book discussion that we are having online today. We will be discussing a book, How China Loses. And we have with us today the author, Dr. Luke Pete, a senior researcher from the Danish Institute for International Studies. And we have a very special panel to discuss this book. Professor Srikant Kondapalli from Jawaharlal Nehru University, Dr. Anurag Viswanath, adjunct fellow at the Institute of Chinese Studies in Delhi and an independent writer, and Pratnashi Basu, my colleague from Observer Research Foundation. A very, very warm welcome to you all. Um, about this book, I my uh, feeling is that um, you know since initiating the whole economic reforms in china in the late 70s china has grown to be the second largest economy in the world and today it boasts of a powerful army which is flexing its muscles and we can see that in the south china sea and along the indian border china under xi jinping is expanding its influence on the world stage through the belt and road project and interestingly, Luke's book is about the pushback and challenges to Xi Jinping's global ambitions. Today, somehow, we are all fixated about the trade war and the geopolitical disputes that are happening between the US and China. Luke's book really throws light on some of the conflicts, the conflicts of the future that may emerge between China and nations in the Europe, in Asia and Africa. Uh, before, before we start this discussion, let me remind our viewers to send in their questions via the Q&A box that they can see on their screens. Uh, Luke, please tell us a little more about your book and you know what, made, what motivated you to write this book. Over to you. Thanks very much, Kalpit, and, and thank you to the uh, Observer Research Foundation for, for hosting this event. It's, it's a pleasure to be with you here. Uh, I mean, my, my book has a very simple message, I think. It's, it's that, you know, the current direction of China's foreign policy uh, has the potential to backfire against its global ambitions. And, you know, we, we often hear about um, the, the fear in, or the, the concern in foreign countries that, that we need to be wary of making China our enemy through our rhetoric and through our behavior. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in, in that advice, but the book demonstrates, I think, that, that China should also heed this warning, that Beijing too, through its rhetoric, uh, through its behavior, can unnecessarily antagonize its foreign ties. Uh, this is particularly the case when we see China's current ties with many of the world's middle powers, countries like India, Japan, Australia, Canada, and, and European powers. There's even some concern in, in emerging and developing economies where China is otherwise viewed quite positively. So I think what motivated me about to write this book was that, you know, I, I started noticing that many countries in the places I traveled were recognizing that there were a lot of benefits from engaging in China, and there still are today, but that they were also seeing that there was a threat from China towards their economic competitiveness or their foreign and, and defense autonomy at the same time. And so what I hope the book demonstrates to readers is that ultimately we live in a world where there is a diversity of power. Uh, and, and in recent years, we have been bombarded by media stories and books and policy analysis fixated on this US-China rivalry. Uh, and that this relationship alone doesn't tell us everything about the global economy and global politics, that the rest of the world matters, the rest of the world will be influential in shaping not only the US-China rivalry, but also the future of China's global influence. So I'm not suggesting in the book that China's not a significant power. It is already an economic superpower. It commands a powerful military, as you mentioned. It's also making you know, new breakthrough technology advancements that are unprecedented for a middle-income country. But just because China may surpass the United States to become the world's largest economy by the end of this decade. That doesn't mean that it has commanding control over global business and global affairs. So what I wanted to do in sort of the next seven, 10 minutes or so is to 
to make the point that we need to rethink some of the questions we ask about China's global influence. And I'll focus on uh, the China's Belt and Road Initiative and China's relationship with the European Union. So the first question I think we need to rethink when it comes to understanding China's global influence is whether the Belt and Road Initiative is a debt trap or just business. I think that question really limits our thinking on China's ultimate global influence. Now, probably as many of you know, the Belt and Road is, is Xi Jinping's signature foreign policy. It's meant to harness hundreds of billions of dollars to finance and build a variety of infrastructure around the world to connect China to new industrial corridors, to spread Chinese technological standards and to foster new political cooperation for Beijing. In the US, in Europe and, and in India, some argue that Beijing has purposely designed the Belt and Road and its finance to ensnare partners in high debt so that it can take control of strategic assets. Others say that this is simply a commercial enterprise. It doesn't have many strategic aspirations. But what I really think will determine the success of the Belt and Road in the long run is whether it spurs on developmental growth for its partner countries. That we're asking the wrong question when we conti continually focus on the debt trap question in particular. So I see three challenges for China's Belt and Road uh, in spurring on that development for its partners. The first is that the projects that China finances through loans are dominated by Chinese contractors and Chinese exports. One study found that 89% of the projects in Asia and Europe were with Chinese contractors and not local industry. And that has the impact of, of basically crowding out local industry, whether it's in Africa or South Asia or Southeast Asia, crowding out local industry from the development of these projects. The second challenge the Belt and Road has for spurring on development is that although developing countries deeply need infrastructure, not any infrastructure at any cost will do. Infrastructure needs to generate new productive activities, new economic growth. And actually China, despite its world-class infrastructure at home, doesn't have a strong track record in building productive infrastructure. One Oxford study found that two thirds of the transport and energy projects it studied in China did actually not produce new productive growth for the Chinese economy. And unlike China, many of the Belt and Road partners have low borrowing capacities. So their infrastructure really needs to be well targeted to support their competitive industries. Thirdly, there has been a promise made by some scholars that tens of millions of manufacturing jobs would offshore from China into Africa, into Latin America, into different parts of Asia. But this is not really happening um, at, a, at a broadly distributed, in a broadly distributed way. Many of Chinese manufacturers, even low cost manufacturers, making clothes and, and other consumer products are automating and staying at home. And those that do go abroad, which are a small percentage, typically head to Southeast or South Asia. Africa, for example, is not seeing tremendously high levels of new manufacturing investment. Now, none of this means that China's trade, investment and finance is not welcome by emerging economies and developing countries. Much of it will spur on some development growth. But the point I'm trying to make here is that not everything China touches turns to gold and that developing countries and emerging economies have a very diverse group of foreign powers as their partners. China is the largest trading partner for Africa, but collectively the European Union still is larger. And the European Union is a critical provider of development aid on the continent. As many know, India's trade with Africa has also skyrocketed over the last two decades. If we look at Southeast Asia, it's actually Japan that's the largest provider of infrastructure finance, both looking backwards and looking towards the future. This despite the achievements of the Belt and Road in that region. And China is Southeast Asia's largest trading partner, but the US is still the largest investor in the region. So China's influence has grown 
in emerging economies and developing countries, but there's still a diverse landscape of power in these regions. The next question I think we need to rethink on China is whether Europe is sacrificing its political values for its economic interests when it comes with dealings with Beijing. This is an important question, of course. We saw a, a recent investment deal between China and the EU go south because of differences over political values and tit for tat sanctions between the region and, and Beijing. But I think what's really going to be driving the future of the EU-China relationship is China's new role as a competitor for European industries. This has really reshaped European thinking on China. And this has come about, I think, for three reasons. Firstly, China's Made in China 2025 industrial policy, first announced in 2015, has really woken up in industry leaders and policymakers here in Europe about the competitiveness of Chinese companies, because that policy is designed to help Chinese companies through state support become leaders in advanced manufacturing and high tech industries. And while this policy has went ahead, Europe has experienced an influx of Chinese investments, not so, so much in recent years, but from 2010 to 2019, these investments were higher than investments going the other way from the EU into China. And many of the Chinese investments in Europe have been targeted at precisely those industries that Made in China 2025 highlights. So takeovers of advanced manufacturing and tech companies in Europe. Lastly, there remains a lack of market reciprocity that the EU sees in China. And Beijing maintains investment restrictions at home that are four times higher than the OECD average. And even this provisional investment deal between the two sides wouldn't have overcome these barriers. So as a result of these conditions, the EU designated China not only as an economic partner, but also as a strategic competitor and a systemic rival in 2019. And this goes beyond just policy statements and, and words on paper. With China on its mind, the EU has launched an investment screening mechanism, uh, anti-dumping and anti-subsidy rules, and individual member states, including Germany, Italy, and other large economies have raised their own barriers on foreign acquisitions and have even blocked Chinese investments last year in advanced manufacturing and the semiconductor industry. So this cuts off one of the avenues to which China could increase its technological capabilities going forward. That foreign acquisition in Europe, or if you consider in the US or in Japan, or even in India has been tightened up because of China's wider economic and political behavior. So to conclude very briefly, I hope those who, who do read the book are, are swayed by the argument that China's rise in the world will not be determined by what happens in the US-China rivalry. US and China, they make up 40% of the global economy, but there's another 60% out there. There are other militaries, there are other technological leaders, and these countries will help shape global issues moving forward. Neither do I think we sh should assume that China's as ascendancy to the commanding heights of global business and of global affairs is preordained. Chinese leaders, their behavior, how they choose to project their power has an impact on the world and has an impact on their global influence, sometimes ultimately constraining it. This doesn't mean that we will see a, a return of the US as the sole superpower, but that we're entering a world and we're living in a world that will continue to have a diversity of power. The last point is, is that the middle powers of the world, including India, Japan, Germany, they have to go beyond just recognizing these challenges of China's rise, but collectively respond to protect their own interests when China oversteps. This will entail locating where to compete with China. It could be on developing tech standards or deterring China's military assertiveness in Asia, but it also means continuing to cooperate with China, such as on climate change. Only by working together, I think New Delhi and Tokyo and Berlin and other foreign capitals can really strengthen multilateralism and steer us towards a world uh, that's governed by rules rather than raw power. I really look forward to, to the panel discussion and the comments on the book. Thanks.
thank you so much for your brilliant presentation on the book yuk um see there has been a huge emphasis on the modernization of the people's liberation army under xi jinping and um, i think if we could kind of come to this a bit later and uh, in fact xi jinping himself started his career in the military bureaucracy of china and we have with us today professor shrikant kondapalli who has written on who has written in fact extensively on china's military transformation over the years and uh, he's also counted among uh, some of the most important thinkers on china so sir over to you and uh, we are eagerly waiting to listen to your comments on the book uh, thanks very much uh, dr mankikar it's a pleasure to uh, read the book uh, congratulations uh, dr patty uh, i think he had a very uh, easy writing style uh, and uh, i could read the book uh, at a stretch uh, and it is really gripping uh, congratulations to you uh, uh unlike in classical scholarship uh what the author had done is to connect the dots um uh, and explain the things for example uh speaking about sudan uh, his interviews with uh, uh mr chian uh, and then relating back in the cnpc office in beijing the sudanese map uh over there uh, i i think those connecting those dots uh, that was very um, useful uh, i think it is a uh, a fantastic read um, uh, dr patty's book i think uh, raises uh, two different uh, you know views that prevailed in europe uh, gerald segel uh, wrote that article famous article does china matter uh some some years ago uh, decades ago actually um, and he considered that uh, that it is of no major consequence in terms of a revolution or in terms of a market or in terms of uh, but today of course in 2021 uh, china is the second largest economy and so it is also one of the largest largest trading partners for the entire european union uh so there is the uh jerry segel's uh opinion uh or observation uh coming to a different strand now uh but it is also not in the league of martin jack uh, who wrote that book on uh, uh you know uh, the uh, rise of china and its uh, implications uh, in a positive manner uh the uh, very tantalizing title that he had had for his book uh, so coming at it, as it were i think the uh, the book has uh, substantial uh, uh, inputs on china's foreign policy or china's foreign uh, outreach uh, related the author suggests that china is a threat in foreign and security policies uh, and so we we see a slightly different argument than the americans would have proposed uh, in terms of a g2 as obama told when chao pao in that dinner meeting in 2009 um so so this is a a, a completely different uh, uh you know kettle of fish uh, so uh, i also like the graphics in between the chapters um uh, you have uh, wonderful uh, maps and uh, Uh, very easy going uh, and very uh, attractive uh, the author actually has um, looked at several aspects uh, in the presentation of course due to lack of time possibly he, he just mentioned about bri and european uh, theaters but there is the uh, african context there is the afpac context there is uh, south america argentina uh belt and road initiative western european uh uh and uh, east asia indo pacific uh and so on and so forth um when it comes to africa again he raises a lot of uh, these uh, scholarly uh, you know uh, uh debates uh, you have debora brotigam mentioning about the dragon's gift um while pushing the chinese uh, enterprises uh, the focac the uh, trade investments uh, 
uh, and over a million Chinese in Africa. So, so the author is uh, uh, skeptical of those, and in the chapter, he paints a very balanced view uh, on the Chinese role in Africa. He visit, revisits that in a different chapter again. Uh, and closer home, um, it is of relevance for us on Pakistan, Afghanistan border areas and what China is up to. Uh, and uh, in in the whole of these, uh, uh, he debunked the the arguments that China has been making recently. Uh, while in the 1980s, China suggested that it will follow an independent foreign policy. It will not have bases abroad. It will not have boots on the ground. Uh, it will, um, it will, uh, for instance, uh, will not, uh, you know, encroach on others in terms of hegemony and so on. Um, so the author tries to locate this argument uh, while discussing issues like uh, Hambantota. Uh, issues like uh, the uh, the African continent, South America, in terms of those, uh, and I do see a certain uh, revival in Chiang He's uh, travels and ideas, uh, and the the efforts that China is making to reconnect with the rest of the world, as the Ming Dynasty tried to do. So we have a seafaring faction, and the fourth and the fifth. Foreign Affairs Work Conferences in China mention about that uh, uh, outreach programs, very specific, uh, Xi Jinping addressing the Foreign Affairs Work Conference, specifically mentioning that, you know, China needs to go out, uh, China needs to, uh, you know, protect its 160 million Chinese who are going abroad for tourism or for other purposes. The 36,000 uh, Chinese enterprises today uh, working in different parts of the world, uh, including in several uh, crisis-ridden uh, places like uh, Libya, Syria, uh, and what could be the uh, the plan B that Chinese can have uh, in these uh, areas. So the uh, the script is being followed uh, since the 19th Party Congress, uh, where you have the uh, the uh, building a uh, a world-class military or occupying the center stage, as Xi Jinping mentioned, uh, those are coming forward. And so he, the author recounts many, one of, many of these uh, substantially. And let me congratulate once again for those aspects. Uh, in terms of a few observations that I have, uh, the, the, in theory terms, uh, there is, of course, you have left out many of the theoretical debates. Um, uh, that would have actually cluttered the flow of uh, the script, but nevertheless, I would like to raise. Uh, when we look at the Chinese uh, arguments, uh, debates, uh, they they were mentioning about five or six theories. Uh, one is China threat theory, China moisture, uh, uh, meaning uh, it is a favorable uh, attraction for investors and so on, which it used to be. Uh, for the FDI technology and so on and so forth, till the uh, Trump's tariff wars. Um, we also saw the hitchhike theory, uh, hitchhiking with the, with the Americans so far uh, till Trump came in. Uh, then we also have the China contribution theory. Uh, then you have the um, China collapse theory, Gordon Chang mentions about it in his book uh, of the same title. Uh, then, uh, in the light of the COVID-19 and others, we also see the uh, China arrogance theory, uh, in the sense that you see the Chinese discords. Um, recently, um, you have these uh, Chinese scholars working on Japan, 200 of them uh, mentioned as traitors by the, uh, by the uh, WeChat community, the social networking community. Uh, so you have a different uh, flavor altogether coming up in terms of nationalism generated generation within China, and that does create uh, problems. Uh, China may address these issues and possibly also uh, curtail its uh, outreach activities through the dual circulation strategy of the 14 five-year plan. Uh, it's quite possible they can have possibly a a plan B uh, instead of uh, encroaching 
on the external domain but but what impresses me there is the uh, chinese concept called qi qi wai jiao uh, active foreign active diplomacy uh, even when they are in trouble you see as you mentioned uh, the special envoy for the middle eastern affairs special envoy for the african affairs from china you know uh, trying to uh, look at these uh, from a different perspective uh, so i i find this very uh, um, analytical and uh, uh, to the point uh, i have a few questions as well um, if you permit uh, while the policy spectrum is in terms of engagement balance of power status quo of course today we cannot deal with china in a status quo is fashion uh, india in some quarters uh, is trying to address china in a in a status quo is manner such as for instance in the rcep or free trade area agreements or on other fronts belt and road initiative as well um, but this is not a viable option for many countries uh, other than us china the uh, uh, the other of course is a big question mark on containment uh, policies uh, so from a policy spectrum these four five uh, do offer some options for many countries uh, which are looking for a, an option Uh, vis a vis uh, china but specific questions that i have is uh, uh, in terms of the boots on the ground in afghanistan um, china is trying with a new himalayan quad uh, with the smaller countries like uh, um, uh, afghanistan nepal uh, sri lanka uh, bangladesh uh, recently just a day before xi jinping sent that telegram to modi Uh, there is also the uh, the wang yi is uh, organizing a third uh, himalayan quad meeting uh, and so this is a possibility uh, in the light of the the taliban resurgence and the september deadline september 11 deadline uh, do you see the chinese putting the boots on the ground uh, it's a very uh, um, futuristic one but nevertheless i would like to raise this is a, a a major uh, debating point here in india on uh, the chinese moves in afghanistan uh, secondly uh, in terms of the uh, bri uh, there are you mentioned about debts uh, and the chinese themselves have actually been um, uh, aware of this problem uh, liu ruko for instance the ex president of the exim bank exim bank and uh, uh, cdb are the major financiers right uh, so exim bank uh, uh, former president said the average liability and debt ratios reached 35 and 126% respectively which is far above than the global averages of 20 and 100% uh, respectively for the uh, average liability and debt ratios uh, so in the light of this the uh, the belt and road initiative still has a lot to answer uh, of course the third uh, uh, third uh, meeting um, last year uh, was online and only 36 foreign ministers attended uh, and lavrov the russian foreign minister um, he circulated a speech uh, he did not formally attend uh, although he was present it, it appears so there is also the russian murmurs uh, quietly Uh, on the bri uh, so the uh, uh, india raised four issues with the bri on transparency that's environmental uh, fallout and also on the sovereignty related um you covered less on sovereignty uh, aspect uh, but here uh, we see also the american uh, argument about the uh, the Uh, uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty of countries should not be affected uh, pompeo for instance has been flagging this idea for a long time uh, so uh, that is one uh, in terms of european theater uh, the lithuanian vote uh, and the uh, hungarian uh, recent actions uh, that de- really dents into china's uh, 17 plus uh, eu 17 plus uh, you know kind of uh, coupling up Uh, but there is also the nato 70th anniversary declaration uh, about uh, uh, cooperation and competition 
Um, so this is a new thing uh, in the NATO parlance, and that's reflected on the Huawei 5G uh, related aspects uh, or on others. Um, uh, and in the recent times with the EU parliament passing those sanctions on the Xinjiang issue, uh, there is a huge uh, you know, debate. Uh, so would you like to reflect on that uh, as well? Uh, these are some comments that I have. Uh, um, excellent uh, work. Let me congratulate you again. Thank you, Thank you. Much, Professor Pondapalli, for your insightful comments. Uh, now, moving on, our next discussant is Dr. Anurag Viswanath. Uh, she has traveled extensively across China's hinterland, in fact, visiting many of the lesser documented or lesser known areas in China. And uh, her unique study has been about a comparative between Indian and Chinese uh, societies. Uh, she's documented her experiences in her book, Finding India in China. And um, looking forward to your observations, uh, Dr. Viswanath. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kalpit. Uh, congratulations, Luke. Uh, a book is a labor of love. It's, it's a lot of hard work that goes into a, into a book. And I see that you've dedicated the book to your mom. Absolutely delightful. So uh, yes, you ask a very complicated question, is China losing? The answer is yes. But is China winning? The answer is also yes. So I'll take on your book from the vantage point of being in Southeast Asia. And I wanted to focus on China's backyard. Uh, you have sort of neglected a little bit of uh, what is happening in China's backyard. It's very complex and very, very complicated. So as you know, um, in, in Singapore, Singapore, the majority population is ethnic Chinese. But if you ask a Singaporean whether he or she is Chinese, they're likely to take offense. So Chineseness in Singapore is both a rallying point, but it is also a point of friction. So Singapore-China relations have been extremely cordial. A lot of trade and investment that is pouring into Singapore from China. There is the Singapore Chongqing Initiative. There is the land and sea transport connectivity corridor. And uh, there is also at the same time a lot of cooperation with the United States. For instance, you have uh, the possibility of the, uh, of the first fleet being stationed here in Singapore. Singapore and uh, Singapore has also renewed the defense pact with the United States. So uh, the naval bases and the air bases are being used by the US in Singapore. So when you hear about the operations in the South China Sea, one can actually make an educated guess as to where these operations are starting from. So at the same time, you have uh, a lot of friction uh, with, with uh, China. So you have cooperation with China, you have cooperation with, uh, with the US, but you also have conflict with China. Just about two years ago, a leading academic of the LKY School of Public Policy, LKY School of Public Policy is named after Lee Kuan Yew, the first prime minister of uh, Singapore. He's sort of a living legend in, in this part of the world. He was expelled from Singapore. He was asked to leave Singapore on charges of being a foreign spy for a foreign country. So one can also guess which the country was uh, following this incident, uh, a former diplomat, Bilahari Kosikan, wrote uh, a, a rational essay, China is messing with your mind. So a very strong position taken by Singapore on, on China. So on one hand, you have the Prime Minister Li Sien Lung, who has gone on record to say that China has been roaming around in the South the uh, East Asian region with lollipops in its pockets. On the other hand, he has also gone on record to say that one cannot quite alienate China. If you look at the ICR survey, the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies state of the survey 2021, 79% of the respondents say that China is the most influential economic power in the region. And only 8% say that America is the influential power in the in the region and if you go back to adp report of 2017 
ADB talks about uh, uh, financing gap in, in, in infrastructure in Asia, uh, almost to the tune of 450 billion. And obviously it is China that is stepping in uh, and filling this investment gap. So if you move on to Malaysia, Singapore is actually very close to Johor. So literally where I'm sitting, Johor is like 40 minutes away. And I'm mentioning Johor because uh, Johor hosts one of the biggest Chinese mega projects in, in, in uh, Malaysia. It's the forest city. And also Singapore is very close to uh, the Malacca Straits. In fact, it was China's Malacca dilemma, the traffic congestion in the Straits of Malacca that galvanized and prompted China to launch the Itai uh, Ilu the Belt and Road Initiative in 2013. So 90% of the world's crude oil actually passes through the Straits of Malacca. So China uh, also has a huge project in Malacca. It's called the Malacca Gateway Project. And of course, in Malaysia, you have uh, the, the East Coast <coughs> railway link which connects the east coast of malaysia you've you've referred to that east coast of malaysia to the the west coast of malaysia from port klang to kota baru but malaysia is sort of also reflects what you've written about in argentina how uh, you know a successive governments there has been a switch between pro china anti china and sort of renegotiating oh. not really pro china but also not really anti china so there was Najib, who was uh, the prime minister, Najib Razak, who was very pro-China. And he was the one who welcomed Chinese trade and investment uh, in the region. So it was during his tenure that you had the Malacca Gateway Project and the Forest City and the Railway Link. But uh, his successor, Mahathir, he actually mobilized votes using uh, the anti-China platform. And all of these investment projects were renegotiated. So um, when it came to the Forest City project, uh, the, the, the residential visas which were granted to the Chinese buyers, that was stalled. The East Coast Railway Link, that was renegotiated and the prices slashed. And the Malacca Gateway project was also stalled. So when you come to Philippines, it's also very interesting uh, what has been uh, happening in Philippines. And I think you have not quite uh, referred to the complexity of what is happening in Philippines. If you remember in 2016, that was the ICJ court case and uh, the, the tribunal basically ruled in favor of Philippines. So Duterte, as you know, is a very, very colorful man. And that was the time, 2016, when he declared his separation from the United States, his divorce from the United States. He, he, uh, he called uh, Obama, as most of you know, uh, son of uh, X. And uh, he wanted Philippines to be a province of China. And the reason why... Uh, Duterte was currying flavor with Beijing was largely because he wanted investment from China for his ambitious build, build, build project, basically roads, railways, and uh, bridges in, in Philippines. But 2016 to 2015, uh, the 24 billion that Duterte was promised when he visited China, that really hasn't translated uh, and and uh, China hasn't quite met Duterte's expectations, so much so that uh, Duterte has actually gone ahead and signed the VFA Visiting Forces Agreement with the United States. So what I'm saying is that if you look at Southeast Asia, it is a very complex um, configuration. So you have countries which are sitting on the fence, you have countries which are leaning towards China, such as Cambodia and Laos. But uh, you also have countries like Myanmar or Thailand, which are sitting on the fence. You have strategic hedging and balancing between uh, US and, uh, and uh, China. You also have this unique situation of the global pandemic. 
So in times of a global pandemic, you have geopolitical tensions, which are, of course, critical and important. But at this point in time, public health needs have taken a prior priority. So when it comes to Chinese vaccines, China thought it would ride the vaccine wave in this region. In Singapore, Sinovac is still not yet uh, administered. But in countries like Thailand, it is Sinovac. And there has been uh, there have been wide scale, uh, large scale protests in in Thailand about Sinovac. So Indonesia has taken the route of Sinovac. Cambodia almost ninety percent on on Sinovac, and it is only like perhaps yesterday that America uh, joined the Covax scheme. So very late in the game. So when it comes to China, there is this. The ambivalence, there is sitting on the fence, there is hedging, there is balancing, and there is recognition that it is China that puts its money where its mouth is. I also wanted to highlight three uh, important things which are often ignored when when we talk about you know the rise of China and you know China threat and how China is losing. Well, how China is losing? David Shambo already told us a decade ago that China is losing because China is a lonely power. It is a partial power. It is a paper paper tiger. So it really does not have the reach to impact global future, global problems and global trends. And so much so that it was Susan Shirk who carried, who had also said something to the effect that China is a fragile superpower. So I found that, you know, this theoretical formulations missing in your book, which is otherwise very lucid and so readable. I could just read it at one go. So I found these theoretical uh, formulations missing. And very critically, you haven't given credence to the work or the writings or the literature of, uh, of scholars or think tanks in East Asia. So it almost seems that you've weaned everything from the Anglo-Saxon narrative. Uh, also, you haven't uh, given credence to Koshue scholars. You know, what are the Chinese scholars saying about how China is losing? Of course, you know, uh, you know, it would have probably added on uh, a little bit uh, to, to, uh, to the main argument in your uh, book. So yes, uh, so to come uh, to come back to you know Shambo and uh, Susan Shirk, uh, well, China has itself to blame for its belligerent foreign policy. It's been very belligerent, very aggressive. It hasn't actually helped the Chinese diplomats have called the the Canadian Prime Minister a boy, or uh, you know the, the the foreign ministry spokesperson tweeting a picture of uh, black workers in the cotton fields and uh, trying to compare it with what is happening in, in, the, in Xinjiang cotton fields, or um, even, you know, uh, a, a Chinese diplomat in Paris calling a researcher a crazed hyena. So in other words, Chinese foreign policy lacks the flair and finesse. It's still quite crude and and coarse and so there has been a fair amount of pushback if you look at what is happening in Hungary right now Hungary received a vast tranche of Sinovac so Sinovac was welcome in in Hungary but at the same time there are large scale protests in Hungary uh, largely because of uh, the the uh, the green signal that the pro china prime minister viktor orban has given to the first overseas branch of futan tashwe in budapest so the budapest mayor has gone around naming some of the streets in budapest by the name of free 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 hong kong uh, I just street wait for uh, dr vispana to join in i think we um, i think she should join in soon Yeah, can you hear me? Oh, okay. So, um, or um, uh, so, uh, in other words, there has been uh, a lot of pushback in in Budapest as well. The other 
other argument that we actually miss is that America's decline is overstated. It is over exaggerated and over hyped. America is not a power in decline. It's still the reigning superpower. So if you look at America's military expenditure, it's almost 750 billion. And China's military expenditure is, is a third. It's 250 billion. So these are the figures of CIPRI. And um, if you look at China's GDP per capita, it is a Xiaokang Shihui. It's about $10,000. But America or South Korea or Japan probably reached this figure almost two decades ago. In fact, uh, America seems to be using China as a rallying point to get its act together, to coagulate and coalesce, coalesce uh, public opinion against China. In other words, China is a victim. It's a victim of American propaganda. It's also a victim of its own propaganda. So I think uh, these are the some of the factors which are sort of overlooked when we look at China. So China is trying to play catch up with uh, America, but uh, the fact is that it is still far behind. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your uh, comments, Dr. Vishwanath. And uh, lastly, we have Pratnashi Basu. Uh, Pratnashi works in the field of maritime law and governance, and she has constantly tracked China's BRI projects and the expanding Chinese footprint in the South China Sea. Over to you, Pratnashri, for your perspective, your unique perspective on the book. Uh, thank you so much, Kalpit. Uh, it's great to be a part of this discussion. And it was a pleasure to read your book, Luke. Uh, to my mind, uh, one of the key takeaways from the book is how it underscores and illustrates the fact that uh, the world comprises several actors at play who will shape global interactions and responses. And therefore, the world politics is really not limited uh, only to US-China competition. Uh, hence, while uh, economic and political influence of Washington and Beijing does weigh heavily, uh, viewing these changes in the global order only through the prism of US-China interactions uh, stands to limit our understanding and uh, assessments and uh, also does not give due credit to other forces and actors which are shaping uh, world affairs. Uh, now, uh, the book serves as uh, an important uh, reality check in the sense that, as uh, Luke writes, uh, global media loves to over-dramatize. Um, uh, and when China is involved in any issue, the dramatization index soars even higher. And so it's very important to understand the actual temperature, so to speak. Uh, so, for instance, uh, Luke shows how uh, sanctions and bans which are imposed by China have been limited in scope and not really upended entire economies as uh, the media would have us believe. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the author also reasons that this approach by Beijing may be subject to change, uh, with the latter more inclined to uh, apply great pressure, greater pressure as the country's economic self-sufficiency increases. So increasingly, uh, albeit in a fragmented manner, we are and will continue to be witnessing pushbacks uh, to China's plans and its coercions uh, from different pockets across the world. Uh, and in addition to articulating concerns in uh, multilateral platforms, countries are also coming together to create informal groupings, uh, which serve a dual purpose. Uh, that of flexible agenda-based cooperation and at the same time reaffirming values uh, of democracy, uh, free and open rules-based interactions, and so on. Uh, this is particularly evident in the case of the South China Sea, for instance, where uh, since 2019, approximately, there, have been, uh, there has been a gradual yet steady uh, development in policy approaches of the ASEAN and the uh, South China Sea littorals. So as countries converge over safeguarding freedom of navigation and the salience of acknowledging international laws and codes of conduct, uh, the significance of littoral countries in the South China Sea region has automatically risen. Uh, so among these countries uh, of uh, the East Indian Ocean and the South China Sea, Vietnam uh, has been one of the most vocal countries regarding uh, maritime dispute in the region. And it has turned out to be one of the most prominent ones to back uh, efforts that seek to uh, contain or confront Chinese advances. Uh, also, prior to the adoption of the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific in 2019, uh, the organization had been reluctant, characteristically, to identify the Indo-Pacific as a theater 
where its centrality is to be exercised. So while on the one hand, the Indo-Pacific narrative gained, gained ground uh, not only uh, uh, and not only regional but external actors became interested and vocal about it, the ASEAN had refrained from taking a clear position on uh, the competing maritime territorial claims and China's overtures, and it settled instead for a more general pronouncements on the importance of freedom of navigation. Now this has largely uh, since uh, changed and uh, since various it was largely because actually since various member states of ASEAN have varying equations with China, but um, while these issues continue to linger, the adoption of the ASEAN outlook uh, signals a shift indicating that the organization uh, is possibly no longer keen on continuing to remain on the sidelines of happenings in its own backyard. Uh, and this brings me to my next point, which is that increasingly we find that uh, the essential point of divergence with China, uh, no matter what the specific issue might be, uh, is one of value. And uh, going forward, I believe that responses to China will continue to comprise former pushbacks unless Beijing alters its own behavior, which is a very likely scenario. Uh, therefore, there needs to be uh, considered efforts on the part of other countries to ensure that uh, responses and reactions do not escalate into a situation of conflict. Uh, there is a substantial degree of trust deficit in many of China's bilateral uh, and uh, multilateral ties, for instance, with India too. And uh, recent developments show that there are perhaps more grounds for difference than commonality. Uh, but if China is truly invested in improving and strengthening its uh, geopolitical relationships, then the world needs to see uh, proactive and constructive steps uh, towards this instead of actions which indicate otherwise. Uh, today's world comprises of extensive interconnections and any particular conflict therefore has the potential to uh, have a ripple effect on countries and institutions other than the immediate or direct stakeholders. It is therefore desirable that uh, potential conflicts not be unnecessarily stoked as you also mentioned in your book and um, as a competition for the sake of it will only sort of result in a strain on resources. Uh, at the same time, however, it must be considered that in the case of China, it has a history, especially uh, a very uh, uh, prominent one recently of violating international norms. Uh, a more constructive approach to making China comply is perhaps to put in place deterrence measures uh, while providing sufficient encouragement so that it eventually recognizes the framework of international law and order. Uh, one way of achieving this is, of course, through stronger and more dynamic institutional mechanisms. And more importantly, there should be efforts towards ascertaining areas of common interests, uh, which offer scope for China to contribute constructively in order to draw it into the global uh, rules-based order and uh, leverage it in a beneficial role. Uh, thank you so much. That is uh, my take on the book. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Prasna Shri. And uh, a big thank you to all the three discussants for your comments and observations on the book. And uh, I think in the fitness of things, uh, I think Luke should be responding to your comments. Over to you, Luke. Yes. Um, thank you so much for those comments uh, from the entire panel. The, the extremely useful and, 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 and a wealth of, of uh, knowledge uh, and, and, and very, uh, I think, uh, really uh, pinpoint some of the uh, facets of the book uh, and, and some going beyond it as well. So thank you for, for those comments. Uh, I will, in the essence, in the sake, for time's sake, I will sort of go over some of the points you raised, but, but not exhaustively, unfortunately. Um, I think, will we see Chinese boots on the ground over or, uh, in Afghanistan or in other places in the world? I, I think it's only a matter of time. Um, uh, you know, Lee, Liu Guajin, uh, the former uh, uh, special envoy, Chinese special envoy to Africa, you know, uh, once told me that it, it, it's, it's really just the uh, capability uh, and, and the lack of capability that China has had in the past that has limited its engagement uh, in, in not necessarily military activities, but sort of peacekeeping uh, and, and, and other um, uh, non-military uh, uh, activities. Uh, and I think that is also something that will dictate China's future engagement in uh, overseas, including, of course, uh, in neighboring Afghanistan as well. Um, you know, 
people often point out that the Americans have over 800 military bases around the world and, and China only has uh, the one in Djibouti. Of course, the, the US uh, uh, is a very special case um, and, 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 and China is not alone in having a, a military base in Djibouti. Many other countries have one there. But we are seeing uh, the slow growth of Chinese military activity abroad. We know there are military facilities across the border uh, from Afghanistan and Tajikistan. Um, there, if you are a, a South China Sea a claimant state um, um, and you are looking at, at, at th that body of water, uh, you might also think that there are quite a number of other Chinese military facilities and bases outside of China. So we do see a growing uh, Chinese military footprint in the region and, and beyond. And I think that should be expected to grow. And I think it's only a matter of time before uh, Chinese nationals or Chinese investment comes under threat uh, and Chinese military forces respond to that. And I think that will happen with the acceptance of that government, be it uh, in Afghanistan or elsewhere. Um, and it will also include China's support to national forces in Afghanistan, uh, China's support potentially to, to Taliban as well, of course. So I think we will see a more engaged China. Um, even uh, if it, it claims it, it won't be doing such actions. I agree uh, on Southeast Asia. Asia um, I agree it's, it's a very complex region. Uh, you know, Japan is number one on finance uh, when it comes to infrastructure. China is definitely number one on trade, but it's also number one on marketing. Uh, the Japanese don't have the same type of promotion uh, and, and, and spotlight on their activities in the region. Uh, despite their strong presence, uh, they are still number one in building um, railways and, and other infrastructure in the region. Uh, and the U.S., uh, as you say, uh, um, is its decline is overstated, uh, and it is still the number one investor in Southeast Asia. So this region in particular, uh, I, I haven't mentioned, of course, the, the influence of the EU and of India. This region will be quite one to watch. Um, the book purposely didn't ask the question, what does China want? Because I feel at least in, in, in the Europe and North America, this question has been asked many times by many uh, China scholars. And, um, not being a Sinologist myself, I wanted to look at some countries, some regions in the world, how they were responding to China. So I do try to bring in some Chinese academics viewpoints uh, and speak to Chinese overseas that I met along the way. Um, but no, it's not a book about what China wants. It's about how the world is responding to this new empowered China. Um, I will leave it there uh, uh, and thank you for those great comments. That was a lovely discussion. All of you, a lovely discussion. I was wondering if we could uh, just factor in a single question because we have a little bit of time left. And uh, this is a development that happened uh, in the last uh, one day. The, the Indian National Committee uh, which uh, uh, for the Olympics, they dropped the Chinese uh, sportswear. There was a Chinese sportswear brand that was supposed to be the uh, official kit sponsor for the Indian contingent. And this has been dropped from the Tokyo Olympics. Um, in the whole context of a pushback, do you see this? Do you see a, a pushback also happening in the whole cultural spheres in, in sports? And do you see that shadow kind of loom over the, the whole Tokyo Olympics? Uh, uh, the uh, the Olympics uh, as such. Uh, yes, I, I think you know the Winter Olympics will be uh, in, uh, in Beijing in 2022 will be you know quite a, a, a political event. Unfortunately, even though they're not supposed to represent uh, politics um, because of of frayed ties, um, you know I think China's rise has sort of. Um, cemented uh, a regionalization in the global economy. And, and I worry that that will also cut off a lot of uh, cultural uh, ties between regions. So we see you know, China's dual circulation strategy trying to uh, lower its self-sufficiencies on the outside world. We see uh, President uh, Joseph Biden's uh, new uh, industrial policy in the US, uh, basically trying to lift up American um, uh, business. Uh, we see defensive industrial policies here in EU. And, and I think there are some similar developments in India as well. So, you know, th this is this is worrying, not not only um, uh, because it may, you know, cut off new trade and investment links between the
these countries and regions, but also it may, I think, overlap into the cultural sphere as well. Okay, I think we've completely run out of time and um, I think we'll have to end it there. I thank everyone who who's logged in today for our book discussion and uh, thank you all. Thank you, Luke, and uh, thank you, Professor Kondapalli, Dr. Viswanath and Pratnashree. And uh, do stay tuned for many more such interesting discussions that we will be having on China and other issues on the ORF YouTube channel. Thank you.